Well, we're going to get started. Welcome to the class, guys. I'm glad you're here. And whether you're attending live or listening online, um, I'm glad you've chosen to deepen your knowledge of the understanding of the Old Testament through learning a little bit of the original language it was written in. I just finished my two second semesters in uh, Hebrews class at Purdue University. And uh, actually, I was motivated to take it by my daughter, Natalie. She had taken four semesters and learned a lot. The professor was her favorite professor at Purdue. And then my younger daughter decided to take it based on her recommendation. And so I asked my younger daughter, Mariah, if she would mind mom being in class with her. <laughs> and she said that would be OK. And I thought, well, it's a drive up there. But I get to see my daughter a couple of times a week. And my other daughter lives there. And so I, um, I definitely wanted to deepen my understanding of the Old Testament and be closer to God through that. So hopefully I can pass that on to you. I'm certainly not an expert after two semesters, but I like to pass along what I've learned. So the title today is Uncovering Old Testament Treasures Through the Hebrew Language. In a, just a few minutes, you'll have an opportunity to actually read a few words that you probably already know in Hebrew. So you'll be sem semi-experts by the end of the class. <laughs> we may even, through the look at the Hebrew definition, solve the age-old problem of whether the world was created in six 24-hour days or six periods of time by looking at the original language. So our next class, uh, which is actually in, in two weeks because we're not having one on Mother's Day, will be interactive. So bring your tablets or smartphones. We're going to actually look at some apps, some Hebrew apps that will help you in the future. So it'll be a lot of fun. So now to some new, um, some basic facts here. The Old Testament was written most, mostly in biblical or archaic Hebrew. That's with the exception of the books of Daniel and Ezra. And those were probably written in Aramaic. Archaic Hebrew dates back past 1500 BC. And by Jesus' day, it was replaced by Aramaic. And that's actually closely related to the Hebrew language, kind of like Portuguese is related to Spanish. Uh, it's laid out differently. In the Old Testament, that's the uh, part of the Bible that's written in originally in Hebrew. The first five are like our Old Testament. But originally, they, they had eight books of the prophets that were together, as you see. First and Second Samuel is one book. Same with First and Second Kings. You've got Ruth is later on in the Bible than we have it. The 12 uh, minor prophets are all uh, lumped together, including Hosea, Amos, Micah, etc. And um, you see the Chronicles is at the end of the Old Testament Bible. So I'm, ha I'm bringing my Hebrew Bible to church to follow along whenever they <laughs> turn to the Old Testament, but I'm kind of having a hard time getting used to where things are, so I have to cheat and look at the index. <laughs> This is the Hebrew Bible, and I'll have a handout to give you guys when you leave, so you don't need to take notes on a couple of these. So this is quite interesting. It's read from right to left. So you start with Aleph. That's the A. A, B. And if you put those two words together, you have Aleph Bet. Alphabet. So that's kind of neat. That's A and the B. And so um, these are just the consonants, which is what the original Hebrew language existed of, just consonants. Um, there are 22 consonants. Here we have some extras, like you'll see um, down in the middle where it says mem. There's another one that says mem. The first one is just where you'd see that letter, which is like an M in the middle of the word. The second one is called the final, the final consonant, and that would be if you have the end of the word, so they're different on some of the letters. Like pe and fe are the same letter. The second one closer to me is going to be the one that you'd find at the end of a word. So actually, you get a laugh out of the fact that when I first got my Hebrew Bible, I was really excited. And I opened up the cover and put a little sticker. It had my name in the front cover. And then when I got to class, they said, oh, open your Bibles. And you open it from the back cover. <laughs> so I had my sticker in now the back cover of the, <laughs> of the Bible. But it took a little while for me to get used to um, reading right to left. Um, another thing that's um, interesting is you will see and uh, here we can have some audience participation, how some of them are very similar. And as you recall, um, they were copied by hand for decades, centuries. So which, which two do you think would be the hardest to distinguish if you were reading a handwritten copy? Margaret? Gimel in the first row and none, the second none in the second row. Right, mm-hmm. And the calf in the bed. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Oh. It's right, right down there. Second one to the, all the way to the right. Mm -hmm. Is it shut and hang? Uh huh. <laughs> and I mean, it's really. And when I write those, it's just really important to have that space there on the one. Right, and then you've got the, the dollet and the top row and the reish down here. Yeah, and Look. the shemek and the, did you already say that? I'm and sorry, which one? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. Those are really similar. So that's why it's really important to, um, well, I should say I was, I'm really grateful <laughs> for all the um, copiers that did an excellent job. We did an exercise in class um, where the first person in every row in class was given a Hebrew sentence to copy and on a piece of paper, then they copied it and they handed their copy back to the next person who copied it. And so we could see in real life <laughs> form, yes. <laughs> and um, there were some uh, accident, there's some mistakes put in on purpose. And what we tended to do is correct right. the mistakes. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, well let's turn in your Bibles to uh, Psalm 119. This is, and you may know this about Psalm 119, it's an acrostic poem, uh, an acrostic psalm, which means that each section begins with a new letter of the alphabet. And in most of your versions, you will have little headings um, in your translations where you see the Hebrew letters. Tell me if, if you're there and you see that. Yep. So you have Aleph, right? Mm -hmm. And Beit, then Gimel. So now you can impress your friends <laughs> that you know the Hebrew alphabet, and about this, this psalm. Okay, next we're going to um, try, try your hand at this. This is the word, the top word is the word meaning she. Interestingly enough, it's pronounced he. <laughs> so, <laughs> try that for confusion. The bottom word means he, and it's pronounced who. But the main thing is, see how similar they are. Yeah. And if someone just kind of didn't bring, that's a yod in the middle, didn't bring the yod down far enough or halfway down or that one was shorter, it can totally change the meaning of the passage. But it makes me really grateful for how the scribes, they double check, triple, quadruple, they did all these checks to be sure it was accurate. Like they had, you know, they counted the, the middle letter in the whole page and they on their copy to be sure the middle letter in the page was the same one so I'm really grateful that they took all that time to be sure they're uh, correctly copying God's Word this is the Old Testament I mean the um, Ten Commandments I think it's really cool that um, we are looking at this in the language that it originally came down that's why I call it the language of God I mean God gave us the Ten Commandments in Hebrew now this is a a summary of each of the commandments. But so when I was in this class, I felt like I was going back in time, you know, and also learning about the culture of the Israelites. I just feel like I almost was one of them in a little small sense, just um, understanding some of the nuances of scripture that only they would understand because they're in that culture. Okay, in the next page of your handout, second page, you'll see that each consonant also represents a number in Hebrew. So when you get to 10, the way you do 11 is kind of like Spanish. If you know Spanish, you add the 10 plus the 1. So the number for 11 would be the Yod plus the Aleph. Um, and the vowels, as many of you may know, were not written originally, but they were understood. So um, then to preserve the Hebrew language, later on, the vowels were created so that we wouldn't lose what they mean. But um, they were created for people who did not grow up in the culture who would not just have that understanding. So let's, there's a little example for us. So, you smart ones out there. How, what would this say? Anyone want to raise their hand and figure out, okay. Linda? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son uh, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Right, so this is kind of how it would be like for them. Um, you read that fine and they would be able to read the Bible like this, but let's say you pass this down, down verbally and didn't write it down, it would be easy to see how something might be, be misinterpreted. So the next one, uh, handout, page in the handout you have is the vowel points. And this is just for your information. I know it's a kind of a lot of knowledge. But so they added these little dots and stuff underneath. 
and uh, you can see how the vowels match up with um, our sounds that we make in the English language. So here's how the writing works. You have your consonants, and then you have one consonant, and underneath it is the vowel that comes after it. And then you go back up to the consonant, and then underneath. So for every consonant, there's a vowel. One consonant, one vowel. So there's not like the diphthongs that we have in the English language. However, for me, being an older student, <laughs> going back to school, it was just tricky because you kind of have to read in a zigzag pattern from right to left. So everybody else in class, all the young ones, you know, we'd be called upon to read out loud. And I just felt like I was a first grader <laughs> trying to sound out the words really slowly. But I got there. It was just slower <laughs> than everybody else. Okay, so let's try this. This is um, a word, and I want you to kind of look at the first and second page and try not to say it. If, you're, if you get it quickly, I'll walk you through it. So we're going right to left. So the first one is the letter A, Aleph, but it's silent. So if you look underneath that, the line there, it's called the pata, is stands for ah. Okay? So that's ah. The second letter is what? Bet, mm -hmm. and that's the B sound, like a B. Underneath it is another A ah sound, and then it's silent. So what would you get? Anybody got it? Abba. Abba. So what is that? Abba. Father, right. So you guys know Hebrew now. <laughs> You're on a roll. <laughs> okay, here's another one. So let's just see if you can take a second by yourself. I'll give you a few seconds to see if you can figure out what this is. This is a Hebrew word. It's maybe not as common as Abba, but I think a lot of you will know this Hebrew word. Yeah. Shalom. Shalom. Yes. Which one of those two? Shalom. So the sh the sh sound ah. And this lamin is ul, low, and then the, the, the vav with the dot on it is the o, and the m is the final mame. I remember I said there was a regular mame and the final mame. So shalom, does anybody, you know what that means? How does it sound in Hebrew? Shalom. Okay. Shalom. Mm -hmm. Peace. Peace, yes. It also means wellness and health, general wellness. You'd say it like you'd ask somebody, how are you? You'd ask them how their shalom was, and you'd return and say, I'm well, I have shalom. So it's a little different. So that's just an example of how it's a little bit different. It means peace, but it means whole wellness. So now I'd like to talk about um, inherent problem with translation, words that have multiple definitions. So we have that in our language, obviously. The problem comes when you use the wrong definition in, the, in this particular instance. And that's why I'm really glad you guys are here. Um, it especially is important for preachers and evangelists or women that are teaching classes if you choose to, which I think is a great idea, look up the Hebrew or even Greek, this applies to Greek too, definition, it's really important that you find the correct definition for that instance. And we'll talk about that next time, how to do that. There's some resources that it's great that we live in the age of modern technology. We have a lot of resources for that. Um, so here's an example. I actually give credit to my daughter Natalie for this example. Here's a person, <laughs> I could say that she's, um, Running to, the, running to the store, she's running back from the store. So if, if you spoke a different language and didn't know English at all, and I said this is an example of someone running to and from the store, and you had this in your mind, um, you might also look up a different definition and you might think she was doing this, <coughs> which she's not. I mean, you know, so you can see if someone was teaching a class in another language and saying, Run means like you do as fast as you can and you give it everything you've got, like a marathon runner. And can you believe when they go to the store every week, they have to do this? They have to run like this? That's what we do, guys, if we take the Hebrew word and if we're not careful. That's why I think this is so important. If you're going to be in a teaching situation, that you take the time to, to really dig into that. And so here's a, another instance, the word in the Bible that's been translated in English as law should be more correctly translated teaching. They're about the same, but there's a little bit different feeling when I say here's the laws and here's the teachings. So that's just one example. 
Isaiah 7.14, we're going to kind of work through another example just to kind of throw you off a little bit and get you thinking. <laughs> Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and we will call, and we'll call him Emmanuel. So the Hebrew word here that we translate for virgin really in Hebrew means young woman. So it's generally assumed back in that day that that means virgin, but it's not strictly virgin by definition. So you can see how things kind of get, <laughs> you have to really dig here. The word will conceive right here um, is literally translated is pregnant. So not future will conceive, but is. So, you know, I don't want to shake anybody's world, <laughs> but <laughs> it could very well be that the phrase, the virgin will conceive, could be translated, the young woman is pregnant. So you can see that <laughs> there's a lot of different things. Now, I believe the things that we need for salvation and being close to God and living how he wants us to live, I think he would very clearly make sure that we have that exactly straight. But, um, you know, things are open to translation. So I think what I'm saying here is it's good to not to mistrust the translations, but to use your own brain. You know, it's kind of like when Jesus talked with the disciples and, you know, those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, some people understood because they really wanted to and they wanted to dig deeper and other people, the masses and the crowds didn't get it. So that's what I want to encourage all of you to do is to dig deeper. Okay, here's a few words for God. The first one is Yahweh, and if you're reading from the right to the left, that is Yahweh. Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey. And you notice there are no vowels, and this is even in the Hebrew of the Bible. And so that um, was common them out of, no, uh, respect, out of respect for God, there were no vowels, even when they were added. So, and it was not spoken because the word was considered too holy to pronounce. So in our class, we translate this Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, which is different than just regular Lord. This is the one and only Yahweh, as opposed to Lord can mean master and that type of thing. Uh, we also translate this Adonai when we're reading in class. Um, the next one is Elohim, that means God, but actually the, the end mame is for plural words in a lot of cases, so it's plural. So then, when I first learned this, I'm like, what? <laughs> plural gods, but, but to the Hebrews, it meant God of gods. At first I was thinking, Trinity? You know, <laughs> I was kind of trying to figure that out, but it means God of God. Um, and some words in the Hebrew, I shouldn't say some words, most word nouns are either masculine or feminine, kind of like other languages. Interestingly enough, the words for God are masculine, but the word for Holy Spirit is feminine. And it also means breath. Holy Spirit means breath. Okay, this is just fun. This is just kind of fun stuff. Um, interesting gender assignments, whether or not a word is feminine or masculine. The words for land, ground, and world are feminine. Many parts of the body, especially those incurring in pairs, are feminine. So you've got your hands, your eyes, your ears, your feet. Those are all feminine words. A few body parts like heart are considered masculine but use feminine plural endings. So go figure. And last one's funny. Strangely enough, an exception to the rule of paired body parts is the word for breast, which is masculine. So <laughs> go figure. <laughs> it's okay, fine. Um, the word for Adam means mankind while Eve means life. So there you go. Mankind is married to life. It's just kind of neat. I just think that's really great. And it can be argued that Adam wasn't from this definition of Hebrew, it can be argued that Adam was not a specific singular man with the name Adam. It could have meant mankind, and that can kind of blow your, <laughs> you know, original conception, but that's an argument. Um, and the Hebrew language is much more active than English, which makes it really exciting. Like in Hosea 1.1, 1, 1, the first part, it says the word, English translation says the word of the Lord that came to Hosea. In Hebrew, it says the word of the Lord that happened to Hosea. Like it happened, like somehow it just happened to him. So there's a lot of things in the Hebrew language that are just really active like that. Everybody doing okay? Hanging with me? Okay. Here's another example we can kind of dig into. This is just fun for me. Just 
digging deep. It's actually caused me, knowing Hebrews, and my professor said this about him himself after I told him, is it's caused me to just slow down in my reading and really, because I'll, I'll find myself, and I, I like to learn Greek. He, t- he teaches Greek too, and he says it's a, a lot harder than Hebrew, so I'm not going to learn it. But, I, but at least maybe looking things up more in the interlinear and um, digging deeper. But um, I'll do that a lot. Now I'm looking up, now that I know Hebrew a little bit at least, I, I'm looking up things all the time and comparing them. And it's just, it makes it sink in because I'm not just reading. Okay, that's great. And reading, I'm really digging deep. Okay, so Genesis 1, 1 through 5 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Oh, before I go on. Um, the, f- the word for Genesis in a lot of the books in the Bible is, the, the, the name of the book is the first word of the book. So that's um, in the beginning, and actually the word the is not there. So um, in Hebrew it's in beginning, God. So um, that word is Bereshit, and so the name of, that's Genesis, Bereshit. So in the beginning, okay, now the earth was form, formless and empty darkness over the surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters and God said let there be light and there was light God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from the darkness he called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day so interestingly enough the word for day in Hebrew can also be translated period of time or era Aha. Uh-huh. I, I just went, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, that just goes to show you, if you look into the original language, it might shed some light on some really extremely controversial <laughs> biblical topics. Like we talked about, did the, was the world created in six 24-hour periods or six periods of time? So, um, you know, that's why it's so critical, like I said, to really dig deep. Let's look at another creation account. I'll let you just struggle with that. I'm not saying what you know I particularly think but it it really opens it up but this may help you a little bit to understand what may be the original meaning Um, Genesis 1 14 through 19 and God said let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth and it was so God made two great lights the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. So let's look back up in the first part of the passage. It said part of the the whole point of the light, the day, separating the day from the night and the stars in the sky was to mark the times into the days and the years. This happened on day four. So if you follow me here, um, the first day, if you think about what, what makes a day, how do we know it's 24 hours, not 25 hours, or 23 hours? Anybody? Right, right. The revolving, and it's always going around the sun, but the revolving in reference to the sun. So that's a 24-hour period. So if there was no sun, because the star sun is a star until the fourth day, then how could there be 24-hour days on days one, two, and three? I mean, it's just, this is what I love. This is kind of geeking me out, but I'm like, okay, this is really good to dig deep. Now, this is not going to be a matter of salvation, obviously, but it's just, I just love it. So anyway, something else to think about. Okay, Genesis 22, 13 and 14. Abraham looked up, and there was in a thicket, he saw a a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it on a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. What's very interesting is if you look up that word provided, in Hebrew it means nothing close to provided. It means to see. There's no other way around it. It's just, you look up in the dictionary, there's not even, you know how you have different ones, it's, there's nothing that says provided. So then we have to think for ourselves here, okay? <laughs> so what did a Hebrew think? What was an Israelite thinking? So we know the story about, you know, God called um, Abraham to sacrifice Isaac. And by the way, the verb tense, we'll talk more about this next time, the verb tense 
different verb tenses a lot more than like in our language or Spanish or anything. There's just different degrees of things. Like if the word to kill, they, ha they have different tenses. There's one tense is to kill. The next text tense is to murder. The next one is to slaughter. So they have <laughs> just varying degrees of intensity. But this, um, earlier on in the passage, when it, um, God first calls Abraham to sacrifice Isaac, he uses the verb form that's polite, like saying please, which is really neat to think about too. He first came, now later he gave him a command, but his first approach to Abraham to sacrifice his son was, please take your son. So even things like that, I'm like, wow, that is so cool. But in this passage, um, the word provided means see. And so basically when you think of God as all-knowing, omnipotent, omnipotent, he can see the future, he, you know, he's, he provided that ram instead of Isaac, and he could see it. And sometimes it's translated, the Lord will see to it. So that's what he did. He, he saw, because the only thing that was important to him was that there was a sacrifice. And it's kind of like Jesus was in place of us for the sacrifice. He needed something to fulfill that command. And he saw to it that it was fulfilled, but it was fulfilled through a, a ram that he provided because he saw to it. The, the, everybody follow that? It's like, okay, this is really cool. Right, right. We're going to talk about this a little bit more next time. But something else that's really interesting about um, the Masoretic text is what I'm familiar with, what I have read in class. It's something called accentuation. They read um, in ancient Hebrew and even today in the Jewish synagogues, when they read the text, the scripture of the day during their synagogue services, it is read in, in a chant. So they have certain notes, which me as a music person, I find this pretty cool. So I really geek out on this. So if you see on the top there, um, there's these... Um, little uh, marks. There's one there. You see where I'm following me there, those marks. These are not vowel points. These are indicators of the notes that you kind of say and sing when you read this. So if you look up here at this word, all the way up here. So anyway, they memorize um, from a young age. They memorize these notes and they go with certain words, the examples there. The four examples where, you know, they go up and then they go up higher and down. And then um, these, example, these little symbols go with the actual notation, and then they apply it to the word that it's under. And so um, I'll bring next time a video with, with the lady singing it because it's really cool. But they go ahead and they actually sing that. Uh, we had a, a cantor, that's what they call them, um, a Jewish cantor come to class and do this for us and read. He spent a whole class period just reading for us and explaining it because these notations are actually written in the Bible, in the Masoretic text version of the Bible. And so that everybody who would read it would read it the same way. They'd sing it the same way. And it was really kind of cool. It was like more of a proclamation, you know, like, you know, think of the, the angels singing at Jesus' birth, you know, and just, it just kind of was really cool. So let's see, um, I'm missing a couple things here, unfortunately. Do you have any questions? Right now, or any thoughts, or anything you think this is of? Just very interesting. Yeah, this is yeah, yeah. It is really cool. And I really um, love it. It's it makes me because I understand like with the different your pronunciation, the vowels are below, and with the musical notes, it's giving you direction to mm -hmm. do them right. In mm -hmm. the Chinese language, hmm. it's the same thing. It's like they'll have. Here's the here's the letter, and whether you do it high, medium, or low, hmm. it depends on what the meaning of it is. Hmm. So it's like it's interesting that they have things like that in the Hebrew language that are giving you more direction on how to pronounce things and how to make it more melodic. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just That's very neat. interesting. Yeah. And they read from right to left. Yeah. Yes. It was tricky learning all the letters because they didn't resemble anything like English letters. And all the verbs have just three consonants, and it just seems like to me they were <laughs> the same ones. Like, this looks so much like the other word. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking about a time in my life when I lived with a Jewish family, and they had four children, and when I was uh, in school, and the children went to Hebrew school, and I had to learn this stuff. And, but I felt like it was 
like wrote, like they had to do it, but they didn't really want to do it and they didn't really apply it to their life. Hmm. And I'm also thinking about my Catholic upbringing where we would hear the same prayers wrote, uh, you know, every Sunday and they lost meaning. They, they mm. didn't really, uh, we, we weren't trying to apply it to our lives. Hmm. And so I'm just, in my mind, it's just like, okay, it's kind of neat, the chanting and, you know, that's probably therapeutic on some level, but it doesn't necessarily mean that people are living in the way that God intends. Mm -hmm. That's true. And what's interesting now in modern days is that Hebrew is not really spoken as much by the, let's say, the American Jew doesn't probably speak Hebrew. So it's something that's in church only. They probably learn it. Um, this cantor that came to our class had begun reading scripture when he was six years old. So he, le he learned it in the home. And a lot of them don't even follow the the musical notations because they have it memorized from their homes. And that's something really convicting, you know. They, it sounds like to me, from what I gathered, they have scripture in their homes probably more than we do, where it's just, I mean, to think of what if our children knew the whole book of Genesis so well <laughs> that they knew what notes went with, I mean, that's, that says a lot that that's repeated in their home that much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <coughs> Any other thoughts or questions? Mm -hmm. Even some of the Muslims, they have to memorize the Quran mm -hmm. because I've had students and they mm. know their Quran. I mean, mm -hmm. they memorize it, but they don't memorize it necessarily like for the meaning. Well, I think maybe they do, but they don't. Again, they don't always apply it. But I have one little girl that, that when they stay home, like, the they didn't go to the mosque, but the fathers went. The mothers stayed home and taught, taught the, the children kids hmm. to um, to repeat the um, verses. Hmm. That's neat. Any other questions? Well, here's kind of an assignment for next time. You guys can start now if you happen to have smartphones with you. Is if you think you'll be able to come um, on the twentieth, I'd like for you to. Um, download the Bible, the Blue Letter Bible app, unless some of you already have it. It's called Blue Letter Bible. So it's a free app, um, and you can do that now. We got done a little bit early. Sorry about that. I went through it at home, but it's hard to tell how long it's going to be with questions. And I'm missing a few slides from when we'll Lee. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, this the Blue Letter um, Bible, and you can um, kind of experiment with it between now and then is a wonderful resource. Um, it gives you an interlinear. Does anybody know what you guys are familiar with an interlinear? An interlinear is a resource, either Greek or Hebrew, that takes every word and gives you the, the original um, definition under the word. So like if you said, for God so loved the world, it, it would have four, you have the Hebrew word spelled out, and then under that it would be four or whatever it is, the English, the Hebrew, and then the meaning for each word. And so then you, that, that's a clue. Now, I, I suggest you don't go s super specifically on that because <laughs> you've got to dig deeper into the multiple definitions. But on this Blue Letter Bible app, it's really great. Also, the Bible Hub is another one, but I use the Blue Letter Bible. Um, you can click on the word. It gives you the Strong's definition, uh, which is probably one of the sources that's most, you know, that most people go to. And it also gives you what's called the lexicon definition. And the lexicon is totally amazing, especially they did it pre-computer. Basically, um, it's like a dictionary with every Hebrew word. It gives all the possible definitions. And in the case of some of the lexicons, the one we used in class, it gives every single instance where that word is in the Bible. So you can look up your scripture, like if you're on Isaiah 7, 14, about the virgin. You can look and see down all the way through all the different passages you can find Isaiah 7, 14 and get the meaning of that word in that verse in the day, you know, how, how they would have read it back in their day. And um, that's amazingly helpful. They did all that without a computer. I mean, they went every word of the, bio, or the Old Testament and put it in, which is completely amazing. However, I'd encourage everyone to not rely super heavily on the Greek 
interlinear or, or the Hebrew, there's pros and cons because you pick out one word at a time that helps you dig in, but you miss the flow. It's even in English, especially you teachers, if you, know, if you pick out one word at a time, you might know each word, but it's different than getting the whole sentence together, the whole paragraph together, everything together. So then you have to go back and put it all together. So there are actually two types of um, translations um, into English, and one is actually the, um, the literal. So the things that the translations like NASB, ESV, those are literal, and they go word for word. And so they're not going to flow as well, but I like to refer to NASB a lot because then I'll kind of know the actual true meaning of each word. That's why it's good to compare, you know, not rely completely on the NIV, in my opinion, or completely on whatever, King James or whatever, but just kind of take, um, you know, them all together. And I don't know if you use the, um, the apps that have the parallel Bibles where you have two or three side by side. I just think that's great to do. Any passage you're really wanting to dig deep into the scriptures to really get kind of a feel for it. Some of them are paraphrased, <laughs> um, like the message is paraphrased, which I do use the message uh, when I'm trying to get a complete feel for a passage. But then, of course, the paraphrased is more human interpretation put in there instead of the literal. But it can kind of help us get a different picture, but I usually kind of weigh that a little bit differently <laughs> than, let's say, the NASB. Any other questions before we close out? Mm -hmm. How's the, like, being in this class and learning about, like, the literal transitions of Hebrew, like, affected your, you like, your quiet times? Like, how do you look at reading your Bible? Well, like I said, I dig deeper. Like, I'll see something, especially in the Old Testament, I'll go, oh, let me look up the, the Hebrew word for that to really see what that means. And it causes me, in a good way, to question things. Because as we'll see next time, we're going to look at some specific passages where the English translation, when you go back to the literal, it's really a little bit different. And not that those things matter completely, but there was a reason it was put in there. Like um, in the passage that we just looked at, Genesis 22, there's a place where when God first comes to um, Abraham, he says, take Isaac, your only son, your one son, your one and only son, and sacrifice him. He goes through that thing where he just does each one. And I'm like, why didn't he just say, take Isaac, your one and only son? And he goes, you're one, you're only, you're this. And so you got to just think about what was the reason. And we also studied, it was really interesting in um, Genesis, because we translate a lot of passages, which was the cool part. First semester was just learning the language, which was like learning any language. It's just hard, you know, for me memorization and vocabulary words and everything. But then the second semester we got into translating. And if I was able to take the second year, third and fourth semesters, that's all it is, is translating. But in uh, Genesis 29, we got to um, where, um, I think it's in, in Genesis 29, where um, Jacob was talking with some shepherds before he first met Rachel. And they weren't doing what they were supposed to with the sheep, which is, you know, it's a kind of minor thing. But the way he said it, to a Hebrew reading it, would, would show major irritation. Like he was really irritated at them. Because he said, this is not the time to water the sheep. But he said, the water the cattle, like he was exaggerating. Like, this is, what are you guys doing watering the cattle? It's high noon, you know, you're not supposed to be watering the cattle. But they're not even cattle, it's sheep. So he, you know, blows it out of proportion because he's like, oh, I can't believe these guys. But we would never pick up on that because we don't know the original. So it has, it, like I said, it's caused me to slow down and just really dig deep. I wish I knew Greek. I wish I could just snap my fingers and have like two semesters of Greek under me. <laughs> you know, I mean, it would be great. So, uh-huh. Did you develop any insights into the relationship between the Israelites and God? Like yes, um, it's very much uh, more of a spirit of fearing God than we have. It was just more in the right way, you know, it was just more of a reverence for God, um, which I want to take with me, too, because, we you know, we do want to feel like when Jesus came, he said, you know, we're friends. And so that's true, too. But, I, you know, sometimes I maybe get the two buddy, buddy, chummy, chummy with God and um, there's a balance. So they definitely had the, the awe and the reverence, I think, better than we do, which is what. I wanted to get out of the class. I mean, I wanted to get how did they really, you know, see things.
Good question. Mm -hmm. I also just thought about in the shack, isn't the Holy Spirit female? Mm -hmm. That kind of aligns with what mm -hmm. you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you guys for coming, and I hope to see you next time.